Okay, welcome to USJAA's webinar on becoming a Japanese teacher after JET. My name is Bahia Simons Lane. I'm the executive director for USJAA. I was a JET in Gunma Prefecture from 2005 to 2007. For those of you who are not familiar with USJAA, it is an independent nonprofit 501c3 organization that helps support. Um, and further the U.S.-Japan relationship by providing assistance and support to JET alumni, both uh, JET alumni as individuals, which this series is tailored to, but also we provide support for JET alumni chapters in the United States. Um, if you are a JET alumni, we encourage you to sign up to become a member for U.S. JET AA. There's a free membership and also a sustaining membership, and you can also donate to help us put on more programs like these. Before we start, I'd also like to let you know that we will be having a, another, the next webinar in this series will be on Thursday, August 23rd at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, and 9 a.m. Pacific Time. That webinar is titled, How to Find a Career, with Emily Frank, who is a JET alumni and a career counselor. Today's webinar is on becoming a Japanese teacher after JET, and we have three presenters who will be speaking about different aspects of how to become a Japanese teacher. Now I will pass along the uh, controls to Susan Schmidt, our first presenter. Hello everyone, um, I'm Susan, and um, welcome to this, uh, this webinar where you will find out more about teaching Japanese in the United States. Your participation on the JET program has given you experience in classroom teaching. Maybe you liked it. Maybe you've thought about bringing that experience back to the US and becoming a teacher here. The news we have for you today is that the Japanese language teaching profession needs you. This presentation will describe the ways of entering the language teaching profession in general and becoming a Japanese teacher in particular. We'll explain the traditional process of certification at the state level to teach in K through 12 schools, as well as alternative methods of being certified to teach. We also will look at ways of finding out about job openings in the field and professional development for working teachers. As executive director of the American Association of Teachers of Japanese, I work with Japanese language educators and language programs at all levels of instruction. I don't teach myself, um, but I do have a lot of information. After my quick summary, you'll hear from two teachers, JET alums, who actually made the move and became Japanese teachers after returning from Japan. They're the real experts. The quickest way of summarizing the state of Japanese language education in the United States is to say that the number of learners at all levels has been steady or increasing for some time. But in recent years, the number of teachers has been declining. The graph on the screen shows patterns in survey data that are collected every three years by the Japan Foundation. As you can see, in the most recent year for which we have information on the right side, uh, which was 2015, the number of learners in the US was approaching 180,000. That's shown, that's the black line on the right side of the screen. It actually goes a little higher than is shown on the screen here. But the number of teachers, which is shown by the purple bar, declined by quite a bit in the three years between 2012 and 2015. That decline in the number of teachers is continuing, has been continuing since 2015 as well. There are several causes for it. One important reason is that a generation of teachers who began their careers in the 1980s are now reaching retirement age and they're leaving the field. 
There's a shortage of teachers to replace this retiring generation, particularly at the K through 12 level, and most especially in high schools. If you're thinking about becoming a language teacher, how do you go about it? Teaching at any level requires additional education. Teaching in college these days, even at the level of an instructor, often requires a PhD. At the high school level, where the need is greatest, the education requirements are less strict, but attending a training program to gain certification is often necessary. Most public schools require that their teachers have certifications from their state or from other states whose credentials they honor. Each state's Department of Education, sorry, I went forward too fast, uh-oh, <laughs> excuse me. There we go. Each state's Department of Education has its own requirements and procedures. Private schools may be more flexible. For them, certification is not always required. How can you find out about requirements, training programs, and different paths to certification? Okay, I'm trying to stay on this slide. Bear with me, okay. The best place I can recommend to start looking for this information is a website set up by the Japan Foundation's Los Angeles office. It's called Becoming a Japanese Teacher. At this site, you can find the answers to a lot of questions. Links to state education departments, to teacher preparation programs, and licensing requirements. Another organization called Lang Cred, short for Language Credentials, langcred.org, has a very helpful website where you can click on a map to find information for each state on several ways to get teaching credentials. They have links for each state to teacher training programs and telling which languages those programs cover. So, for example, um, if you, I happen to be located in Colorado, so if you click on Colorado on this map, you will find a list of the colleges and universities that have teacher education programs, and it tells which languages in particular they work with. So, for example, uh, for Japanese, the University of Colorado at Boulder and Colorado College have programs that are specifically geared to giving people credentials to teach, first of all, to teach, second, to teach language, and third, to teach Japanese language. The other part of the page lists the requirements for the state at different education levels. Okay. To find out about job openings, you can visit the website of organizations like mine, AATJ, which has a job line for posting position openings. There are, the two you can see on your screen are for high school teachers, and they were posted uh, quite recently. The Japan Foundation's website also lists job openings, the one we looked at before. You can subscribe to email lists for teachers. One of them is called Sensei Online. They also announce job openings and have discussions of other topics relevant to Japanese teaching. Connect with teachers in your area or nationally through a network of organizations for Japanese teachers or through organizations for world language educators in general. It's an exciting world and we hope you will join us. My last slide here lists um, some of the websites that I showed and a couple of others. Um, 
I did not put my email address here. I intended to do that, but um, you're always welcome to email me with any questions you might have about any of this information or the field in general. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Now we're going to hear from Dan Carolyn. He will talk about his path to teaching Japanese. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm Dan Carroll and I'm teaching, Ken uh, I'm teaching Japanese at Kennedy High School in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, and I'm probably gonna have uh, a story or a path to teaching Japanese. It's gonna be really quite different from um, what yours is, but I think there are some lessons to be learned and um, some takeaways uh, from, from my experience, even though, like I said, I, I believe it'll be quite different from, from your own path. Um, I did the JET program in its very earliest days, 1989 to 1990, which if I'm not mistaken, uh, was the second year, if I recall correctly, of the JET program. And I, I have a funny feeling it may have been a time that was actually before some of you people who are listening were even alive or, or, or even thinking about anything like this. But um, nonetheless, so I, I went there and I, I actually had zero Japanese um, experience before, before going to Japan. Uh, my goal in going to Japan was to explore the world plain and simple. And um, I, I, I was looking into different paths to just go overseas and, and become a teacher and gain some life experience and preferably somewhere in Asia, Africa. So I really had no intention of getting into the Japanese teaching profession in 1989 and 1980. And that didn't come, I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but that really didn't come around until a few years later. Um, I um, I did the JET program for that one year and I returned to the United States. And in, in that year, I decided that I was gonna learn as much Japanese as I possibly could and learn as much about the culture as I possibly could. And I did. Um, when I got back to the States, I really kind of had this feeling that I wasn't really done with this learning adventure that I had embarked upon. And so uh, about five or six months later, I was back in Japan teaching English uh, at a, a Kaiwa school in Chiba Prefecture in Funabashi-shi. Um, and I did that for, for two years. Um, and I, I'll, I'll back up a little bit, I'm sorry. I, I meant to say that um, I actually started my, my teaching career uh, as an English teacher. And so I was working as an English teacher in a high school in upstate New York at the time. Um, and so after that, that second stint in Japan, in, in, uh, in Chiba, I went back to the United States. I went back to Albany, New York. I went to graduate school and I, was, and I got my, grad, uh, my, my master's degree in English. Um, at that time though, I still felt like, gee, I'm really excited about this whole Japanese thing. And they had a Japanese program. And so I was doing that as an independent study um, along with some other students who uh, studied at Kansai Gaidai um, for a year or so. Um, and the turning point really kind of came while I was in graduate school uh, working on a master's degree in English. Um, and I decided, you know, this is, this is interesting, but I think this Japan thing is, is really more interesting than than teaching literature and I, and I still I'm you know still I still love literature but I, I think what it was at the time or no I think I, I know what it was at the time was I was thinking like I have a really unique opportunity here to get into a career in which I can play an instrumental role in getting young American kids and young Japanese kids uh, to meet each other to communicate with each other and to become friends. And I believe that that's a really good thing that I can do um, that would be A, an interesting career, 
and B, I honestly believe would contribute to a better world. And like I said, I, I thought I was in a very unique position to do that. Not many other people, you know, could could speak enough Japanese, et cetera, and you know, and teach Japanese. And 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 about that time, uh, a job a job teaching Japanese uh, opened up right outside of um, Albany, New York, in Averill Park. And so I applied. And uh, at that time, from what I understand, there were actually two applicants. There was me and a um, Japanese woman who lived in the area but had no teaching experience whatsoever and no certification. So they chose me. And so uh, that's how I got my first Japanese teaching job. I was also teaching English because it was a brand new program. And so in order for me to be full time, they had to give me some English classes. Uh, I did that, I did a program, actually prior to starting that pr my first teaching job, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to do a um, Japanese pedagogy program at uh, Ohio State University that summer. And that was interesting in a, in a number of ways. Uh, and there were some, uh, I had some good takeaways from that. And so, in some ways it was of course, uh, or it may have been a little bit, not really quite matching uh, what my, my, my career path was going to be. Um, and so I, I, I continue to move forward. Uh, my, my program at, in Averill Park, New York, looked like it was about to go bust about two years later because the district itself had a number of, of, of budget problems. So I decided to leave there. Um, and from there, I went to Indianapolis and taught Japanese for a year there at a high school, North Central High School in Indianapolis. Um, and in the interim, I had gotten married, so I went back to Japan. Uh, my wife is Japanese, and so we, we went back to Japan. I spent another six years um, in Yokohama. And at that point, I was still thinking, okay, I'm going to go back to the States. I'm going to continue this Japanese thing because I'm really excited about it. it, it it's really exciting. But the opportunity to teach in Yokohama was, was, um, was, 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 was just, you know, and, and to live in Japan again was just too much to resist. Uh, in, the, in the years that I was in Yokohama, I started a program through the University of Sheffield that had a, a distance learning program in Japanese. Um, and so I obtained a master's degree in advanced Japanese studies. And of course, part of that was, I knew that if I was going to try to teach back in the States, as Susan was talking about, uh, you know, getting the credits is, is all important because at this point I had um, JLPT level two, but I didn't have the credits to show for it. And, and you know, state boards of uh, you know, the, the certification boards or the board, um, you know, in each state, they don't care how good you are. They, they want to see the credits on paper. And so um, I did that. So I finished that. Um, and I then wound up getting into my present position at Kennedy High School in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I've been there since 2004. And it's been a great experience. Um, and, you know, and I, and I did that because I, I was, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm from New York, but I was like, you know, forget um, location. I, did, I, I want to do the job. I really want to do this particular job. And as long as I'm with my wife and family, it, you know, it doesn't really matter much to me where I am. Uh, and so I got this job in, in, in Iowa, which, you know, um, kind of surprised me <laughs> at, at first. But I, so I want to get now really a, a little bit to the why and some tips from a, um, a person who's been in the profession for a number of years. And as, as Susan pointed out, uh, you know, there are teachers who are retiring and, and the profession needs you. Um, but why I do this program or why I do this job is, as I mentioned before, because I think I'm in a unique position to get young Americans and young Japanese together uh, and to develop friendships. And I do that. My school, I'm absolutely adamant that, you know, any place if I teach and I, and I've had this for your, all my years at Kennedy, like, I want to have an exchange program. This is very important to me. It's all, you know, it, it matters, uh, you know, profoundly. And so we do have a sister school program. It was important to me to set that up right away. And that uh, is, it's why I do the job. And I tell my kids this every year, 
Um, when I see my kids go to Japan and interact with Japanese kids at our sister school, and when I see the kids from my sister school come here and interact with our kids and they become friends, and these friendships have lasted. I see this on Facebook. You know, they have students who graduated 10 years ago and they're still friends with the person they hosted or who hosted them years ago. Um, it's, it's really all that matters to me. It, it's fantastic. Um, I love the fact that I can bring kids from not knowing, you know, any Japanese to, to being able to communicate in Japanese and become competent in talking and conversing in Japanese. And the other thing is, I think, in particular in Japanese, teachers always do this, but I do believe as a profession, we do it a little bit more. We change lives and we, we really have a strong impact on our kids and they don't forget us. And, you know, um, I'm friends on Facebook with kids I had back in Averill Park in the 90s and kids I had in Indiana in the 90s and, and kids who I graduate today. And, and it, is a, it is a profession in which you really, really can impact a lot of lives. I would say a couple things um, as I kind of want to wrap up my remarks as, you know, advice from an old Japanese teacher. Um, one is I, I always, when I talk to a student who wants to, tells me that they want to become a Japanese teacher, I always tell them you have to get a second certification, um, get a second licensure. I, I'm also licensed in English and, you know, full-time Japanese jobs are, you know, not always, you know, super plentiful. Um, the other thing is to get active and involved right away. Get active and involved in your school, in the Japanese language community. Um, there are all sorts of opportunities to, to make changes, you know, throughout the school. And if you're, if you're very visible in your school, and I try to do that while I'm at Kennedy as much as I can, it, it can only increase your enrollment. And that's an important thing too. Um, and, and, um, and, and as you're active in the Japanese language community, it really does help you develop as a professional. Um, um, you know, the, as Susan said here, you know, the, the profession needs you. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of us who I'm, I'm in my mid fifties and there's a lot of us at, at the same age or older who are teaching and it's time it's for younger people uh, to come into the profession and, and take it to the next step. I believe that's all I have to say right now. Um, so I'm finished. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, for all the listeners, if you have any questions, we will take them at the end. So you can put them in the chat box or you can um, wait and raise your hand virtually at the end and we'll take your questions. Now we're gonna turn uh, this topic over the presentation over to Stephanie Smith, who will have a little bit of a different perspective. Stephanie? Hi, everyone. I have a bit of a unique um, love for Japan. It actually started when I was in elementary school, so I guess I thought I'd give you my personal background um, first. Basically, I fell in love with Japan um, in first grade in, um, in an enrichment class, so we were like learning about Japan, um, but not the language in elementary school. So um, because Portland, Oregon and um, Sapporo are sister cities, there's a lot of sister city action in between the two cities. So um, I got to benefit as an elementary school student from that sister city relationship. Um, my enrichment teacher basically set up the um, pen pal system and we were writing, let, you know, really small short letters in English and then we would receive cards in Japanese from our sister city and it, even though you know we couldn't read Japanese we were just completely in love with getting a card from a, a Japanese friend from our sister city so that's kind of the beginning of my love and then it grew um, as I hosted students in my home as a junior high school student from Japan over the summer so I got to have like real Japanese girlfriends in my house as a junior high school student. So then um, as a high school student, I, ha I, would, I benefited from a high school Japanese program in my small town 
um, suburb of Portland, Oregon high school. So I went to Gladstone High School and had a Japanese um, language course that was actually immersion style. So our 90 minute um, Japanese class was all 100% done in Japanese. Um, my high school teacher was a JET alumni. So he was in Japan with Dan in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and he learned all of his Japanese on the JET program and brought it back to Oregon. And that was awesome. So basically, while I was in high school, I wanted to become my high school Japanese teacher. I thought he was the absolute smartest and had the coolest job and all that. So um, he encouraged me to go to the University of Oregon because the Japanese program was strong. So I went there and I got to study abroad in Japan for a year during my high school or my college years. And so of course I wanted to be on the JET program just like my high school Japanese teacher when I graduated. So I went to Aomori for three years and I didn't just fall in love with Japan or Aomori, but um, teaching as well. So I knew I loved the whole package. Like being an ALT was my favorite job because I loved being in the classroom. I loved being with Japanese students. I loved bringing American culture to Japan and knew that in the future I wanted to bring Japanese culture to American classrooms. So um, I felt like it was just a, a perfect training ground um, as an ALT um, to, to get some teaching experience. But really it made my, my hunger for having my own classroom just grow throughout the three years of being an ALT in Aomori. So I came back um, to the US, I came back to Oregon, and of course I needed to live at home with mom and dad so I could afford to go to grad school. And so um, in Portland, like the number of universities were kind of limited, um, universities that could license me as a high school Japanese teacher in Oregon. So looking into that, my, my options were kind of narrow, but I was, um, fortunate enough to go to a school that I really loved. I went to George Fox University to get my high school, uh, it's a middle school and high school teaching license. Um, and not only for Japanese, but I tagged on, like Dan was talking about earlier, another licensure for ESOL, so it's English for Speakers of Other Languages. So technically, license-wise, I can teach Japanese, or ESL at a middle school or high school in the state of Oregon. So that's where I'm at. Um, so basically, the day that I graduated from grad school, I got a phone call for um, emergency, like long-term subbing at a school that had both an ESL program and a Japanese program. So the Japanese teacher was leaving and Surprise, surprise, I got the phone call um, to be a long-term sub for the last six weeks of the school year to be the ESL fill-in. And then they were basically interviewing me in a way to take over the Japanese program. So it was really cool to be in the building that was looking for a Japanese teacher for the next school year because I got to transition with the outgoing Japanese teacher. So that was an awesome setup. Um, and then um, as a, you know, fresh out of graduate school, young <laughs> te licensed teacher, I took over the Japanese program and I was teaching um, all four levels, Japanese one, two, three, and four, four at Wilsonville High School. And it's, it's a smaller program. I mean, it's really, um, you know, one, it was one of four uh, foreign languages in us smaller high school. So um, I was fortunate to have, you know, kind of smaller class sizes, um, especially the, the two and the three and the four were smaller classes. So I felt like I got to know my students really, really well. And you get that, um, you just get that chance to really get to know your students when you're teaching a language. Guess what? You get to speak and listen to your students speak so much more than some other, you know, classrooms. So I felt really fortunate to get to know my students um, pretty well. And I got to, you know, make a PowerPoint and introduce my life however I wanted to. You know, I could, I could show them a slideshow of the house that I just bought. And I could ask them, you know, is it big? Is it small? What, you know, what do you think of my house? Like, I just bought a house with my husband. I'm so excited. I want to show it to you. So I felt like I got to, I got to teach my students really about any topic as long as I was giving them language 
um, as a package. So we could really go anywhere from, you know, exploring a Japanese map, we explored Japanese cooking, um, we really went all over the place, you know, and we got to introduce our, our families, things that we cared about, our hobbies. And it just, I think it makes the students happy to, to be able to share a piece of their heart with their teachers or their classmates. You know, if they're, if they're really into drawing and they don't get to express that in any other classroom, they, they just really open up when they get to share, you know, share their heart, basically. Um, even if it's hard for them to express in Japanese, I felt like they were happy to share their passion with me. So um, while I was teaching traditional, you know, Japanese, high school Japanese in the classroom, um, I was fortunate to have um, a lot of kind of outside things um, to connect the students with Japanese culture, um, not just trips to Japan, but um, in Oregon, there's a program called Hanichi Homestay. So they're connecting students with a Japanese family in the community just for a short homestay, a Han Nietzsche half day homestay. So really the commitment for the family was to host them for like four to six hours. So that might be like one or maybe two meals. But basically it was an opportunity for my students to say, yes, I want to be in a Japanese home for the day and try to speak Japanese. And obviously they, the host family lived in Oregon, so they had some English language, if not complete fluency in the English language. But um, that was a really cool opportunity to see my students um, that maybe maybe they didn't, couldn't necessarily afford to spend a time in Japan in the summer um, with a trip, but they could just stay in the Portland area and, and meet a Japanese family. So I was, I was really encouraged when students took that opportunity. Um, I did get to do two summer trips. Um, the school district that I worked for, both of the high schools, there's two high schools um, that offer Japan trips. So I did take trips um, with students um, with both high schools, and um, it was completely organized by an outside party. Um, so fortunately, I just got to kind of show up at the airport and take the students on a planned out trip that was, um, was just completely pre-planned and set up. And, and that is, it's so awesome to see how the students do while they're actually in Japan. Um, so yeah, of course their Japanese language um, just soared and they just, you know, had hunger to learn more Japanese while they were in Japan and then to bring that experience back to the classroom when they were done in the summer was really awesome to see. Um, we also hosted a Japan night just to introduce the community that I was teaching in. Um, introduce them to Japanese culture. So things such as, you know, a, a comic um, book introduction, someone brought their collection of comic books, someone brought Japanese video games, someone brought Japanese food, just kind of like what the kids had a passion for in Japan, they introduced the community to. And that was, that was an awesome way to say like, hey, you don't have to know anything about Japan. If you're interested, come on by and we'll teach you what we know. Um, some of my students ended up um, studying high school Japanese and then eventually applied for the JET program. And it's, it's so awesome to go to um, the JET, you know, kind of farewell party each summer. Um, it happens around August 1st in Portland where um, it's their last day in America before they're flying to Japan to start the JET program. And I'm actually seeing my former students in that position now. And to, to know that I was their teacher, like when they were learning how to say konnichiwa back when they were 14 and 15 years old, like it is so awesome. And just to catch up on that, you know, how they've done with Japanese in college and, and what they're planning on doing in Japan as a jet, it's, it's, it's a really, really awesome feeling. So I feel thankful for that. Um, I feel thankful for students that go on to study really hard. I had a student recently pass the JLPT level one, and it's just kind of mind blowing that I was there when he was learning, you know, hiragana and katakana, and now his Japanese is insane, passing level one. Um, basically, yeah, I, I had a full range of students that like Japanese, it was too hard. And you, you see students that, 
just basically say like, I can't do this. And that, that was, that was very difficult to see when you just see students kind of give up on themselves in Japanese class. And then you have the full range of students going all the way through JLBT level one. So um, it's, it's a wild ride. Um, but on the flip side, um, when I was ready to leave traditional classroom teaching, I, um, when I became a mother, I wanted to be at home. So I was looking for a job that I could do. How could I teach Japanese from home? So basically just in a really, you know, just Googling type of how do I, how do I find a job that relates to teaching Japanese or doing something related to Japanese? I just Googled and happened to stumble upon an online K-12 school. So I work for Krista McAuliffe Academy School of Arts and Sciences, and um, they were looking for a Japanese instructor. So really the, the Japanese instructor title, job title popped out to me because that's really what I was looking for. I wanted to be a Japanese teacher, but I also wanted to be at home. So I, I didn't know, you know, this was even possible at the time, but they were looking for a teacher that was just going to stay at home and monitor students who are doing online high school. So these students are learning Japanese using Rosetta Stone primarily. Um, there's a program called Middlebury, which is a, um, a college program, but um, it can be um, kind of fixed for the grade level. So I even have a, an elementary school second grader using the Middlebury program right now, but it's designed for a second grader. And so it's way less assignments than my high school students. I also have students doing Duolingo. So if you're, if you're interested in learning um, a language, definitely I would recommend Duolingo. But um, basically I have students personalizing their education. That's what CMASAS is all about, is, is learning the way that your body works, the way that your learning style works, the way that your schedule works. So I am actually in charge of more than just Japanese. I'm, I'm overseeing the students learning Russian, Korean, and Chinese. So depending on the student, how old they are, what language they're learning, um, that's kind of how we match up which program they're using. But the assessment piece is where I kind of shine as a Japanese instructor because I can get on a Skype with them and really walk them through a Japanese assessment at their level. So if they're learning how to introduce their family, for example, like I can introduce my family, if that helps them, if they're, if they're not ready to say, you know, I have three sisters, I can just kind of walk them through that and say, hey, I have two sisters and give them my personal, you know, just one-on-one -on -one time. And um, so I would say that's a benefit of the online instruction is I get to really set up a time to meet with that student and maybe sometimes the student and their parent and walk them through what they're, what they're needing um, on an individual level. So it's, it's working from home, it's working on my schedule and my student's schedule, the family schedule. Um, so it's very, very different. I, I have a completely different job than I had in the traditional setting, but um, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of um, my two different careers, basically, that I've had as a Japanese teacher. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that anyone has, and I am done. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that um, perspective on teaching. We're going to now move into the question and answer portion. Um, there are three different ways that you can ask questions for the attendees. You can use the Q&A feature, um, you can use the chat, or you can raise your hand by clicking next. Um, so if you have any questions, let us know and uh, the presenters will be happy to answer them. Okay, I've unmuted all of the presenters. Um, I don't see any questions coming in, but I have a question for each of the presenters. I'd like to ask you all, what advice would you give a current JET who knows that they are interested in this career path? Or, or anybody can answer that or? Yeah, anyone can answer that. Okay. Um, I think like 
I said before, a, a couple of things I would say is one is, is be ready to um, have a dual, you know, at least more than one, or at least one more certification and, and be, you know, in order to make your job full time. Um, and if I can go on with a couple, um, I, I would say be flexible about location. Um, uh, you know, if you're really that excited about the profession itself, and if you can be a bit flexible about location and, you know, uh, that would be a good thing too, because we don't really have a whole lot of control over where the programs are going to be. And then my, my third little piece of advice, as I said before, is be active, be involved in the Japanese um, learning and teaching community and be very active in your school. You need to be a visible member of your school. That's a very, very important aspect, I believe. Um, this is Susan. If I can put in a quick comment. Mm -hmm. um, if you are thinking you might want to teach in the U.S. but not sure, and if you don't, if you haven't had teaching experience in the United States before, um, I would advise you to, to visit some schools and see how, how it works in the U.S. Um, I, I don't know um, for sure but my sense about the JET program is that a lot of the people who, are, who go to Japan on the JET program have not been teachers already. And being on the JET program may be their first experience of classroom teaching. And that experience in Japan is quite different from the experience in the United States. So it, uh, it would probably be useful and interesting to visit some classrooms um, to, to find, locate some people who are teaching and especially teaching Japanese in your area and talk to them, visit them, visit their classrooms and uh, just get a sense of what it's like. Thank you, Susan, that, that's great advice. Um, I'm sure that a lot of teachers, especially Japanese teachers will be willing to let you come into their classrooms for a day or two. So definitely pursue that and stephanie um could you repeat the comments that you wrote in the chat yeah i was talking about starting to look for universities that have a japanese program and have a teaching license program because when i left japan and i was ready to get a teaching license i didn't realize the two had in oregon anyway had to go hand in hand so i couldn't just go to any university that had a teaching program for people that wanted an Oregon teaching license, but that, that school also had to have a Japanese program so that they could license me to teach Japanese. Great, great advice, thank you. Um, Dan, I have another question for you. Um, sure. How did you set up the exchange program at your school? Uh, um, good question. Um, I originally set it up through the Laurasian Institution, um, and they run a program called New Perspectives Japan, um, in which they, you know, have American kids go over and do some sightseeing and do a homestay and a school visit at a Japanese school. <clears throat> and um, so, several years back, uh, when I well, actually when I first got to Kennedy. I, I uh, contacted them. I said, this is great. I, I want to participate in this, but here's the deal. I, I, I want to, um, I, I was a little bit fussy. I said, I, I want something uh, within an hour from my wife's um, family's home in, in Funabashi and they found me a school there. Uh, they did a great job. And so that sister school relationship has been going on for 10 years. Wow. That's, um, that's so fantastic. Yeah, Laurasian Institution does that. There's another organization called School Partners Abroad that does uh, things like that, that, you know, will we'll find you um, a sister school. And, you know, if you have a specific request for a certain area, um, they'll do everything they can to accommodate that request. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Um, no we have one more question for Stephanie. Um, did your online, does your online position require the same certification as when you taught in a, a traditional school? 
It does not because I work for a private school and private schools get around the, the teaching license thing. But of course, you know, the private school wanted to know, you know, where I went to school and all that. So I could say that I already have an Oregon teaching license. I, you know, I have my master's in teaching. Um, so, so basically everybody that I work with um, at the school isn't required, but has either a master's and or doctorate currently. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, we're almost out of time and I don't see any more questions coming in. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, first of all, I want to kind of summarize some of the takeaways that I got from hearing everyone's talks. Um, first of all, there's definitely a need for Japanese teachers. So this is a great career path to pursue if it's something that you are interested in. Uh, I also think that as many of the presenters said, JET is a really good place to hone your language skills. And um, getting a secondary certification is very helpful. I also mm -hmm. wanted to mention that there are alternate, that a lot of um, schools have some alternative pathways to certification. So some, depending on the school district, depending on the state, um, you can, and in some cases, get a position based on your Japanese experience and then complete your certification while you're working. I, I do know JET alumni who have done that. So that's something that you could look into. And then private schools as well often have alternative certification. So as <clears throat> Stephanie mentioned, it's still quite competitive. So think about what will make you competitive as a teacher. So in closing, I wanna thank our presenters very much for their time. We really appreciate you talking about your experiences. And um, Stephanie mentioned in the chat, and I'm gonna say this for the benefit of people who are listening to this on recording. She mentioned there are a lot of private Japanese schools in Oregon, and so if you are interested in Oregon, she'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you all for attending. I, uh, we have recorded this webinar, and it will be posted both shared with the Facebook event and on our Facebook page, as well as on the usjaa.org website sometime early next week. So if you, uh, for those of you who are listening to this on repeat, thank you for listening to the recording. Okay, thank you all and good night. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.